Well, I can echo Richard's sentiments from my side. What a joy it is to be able to hang out with him every time we're together. And uh, I feel like uh, he's a bit of a pastor to me. Uh, he has really such a tender heart for the Lord and for, for people, genuine love uh, that is uh, conveyed. And so I'm so, so very appreciative of your, pastors, uh, your pastor as I know uh, you are. Uh, and of course, you know, being able to be here this weekend is a great joy, being able to be here uh, talking about this subject and to be able to be here with, uh, with Abner. One of my colleagues was asking me this week uh, if it was uh, intimidating for me to uh, stand and uh, speak in this conference with Abner Chow, who literally wrote the book on the hermeneutics of biblical writers. And he said it, he said, is that, is that intimidating to you? I mean, he's smart. <laughs> and in spite of what I think he was implying, I was, uh, I was not so dumb that I couldn't pick up what he was implying. I think, at least if I know, maybe I'll have to think about that a little bit more. But... I, I, as I thought about it this, this week, you know, it's not so intimidating uh, because of Abner's uh, uh, brains. Uh, you know, I know that compared to him, I will maybe not come across quite as, as smart. But uh, what was really intimidating knowing Abner is that I know I'm going to come across way more boring than him. He is uh, obviously energetic and enthusiastic and the passion and love that he has for the Word of God comes out every time I get to hear him. So really, really grateful for that. The topic uh, that we are addressing, the New Testament use of the old or, or the inner biblical exegesis is an important topic. It's been one that's been a fascination for mine for a long time, and yet it is one that is a conundrum for a lot of people. Uh, as uh, Dr. Chow was uh, talking about earlier, it has uh, been for both new students and for seasoned students of the Bible, one of those sort of yarns that they can't always quite unravel. They look at the way that some of the Old Testament passages are quoted in the New Testament, and they scratch their head about whether they could ever have seen the same thing that these biblical writers saw, or if they could have come to the same conclusion and uh, more seasoned scholars spend time debating and talking about how exactly they could have come to that conclusion. What was the process? What was the logic or the reasoning or the methodology that was behind all of that? And our goal this weekend is really to show you and to give you the confidence, first of all, that these writers who are using the Old Testament Scripture are using it faithfully. They had, in other words, a very high view of God's Word. And because they had a high view of God's Word, they would regard it and they would deal with it and they would handle it carefully. And not only that, we want to instill in you the confidence that if you are, if you are yourselves willing to devote the time and to uh, pour your heart into the Scripture, if you can, as, uh, as Dr. Chow said, if you can become uh, Bible people, Bible men, Bible women that you too can begin to understand what are essentially threads that run all the way through the Scripture, the interconnectivity of the Scripture itself, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Chow was already talking to us about. And so what I want to do tonight, and what we'll do uh, again a little bit tomorrow, is I want to I do that in sort of a test case, taking the, the passage that Dr. Chow's already introduced to us in Leviticus 18.5, and then showing how that was used by later biblical writers. Uh, I'll be talking about an Old Testament passage tonight that, uh, that uses Leviticus 18. And then in the morning, we're going to talk about New Testament passages that continue on using that same passage in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5. Because when we think about these uses of the uh, of the Scripture, the uses of the Old Testament, particularly in the New, we have a tendency sometimes, I like to use this illustration, we have a tendency to kind of think of two ponds. Like you have this pond in the Old Testament, you have this pond in the New Testament, and the, and the biblical writer in the New Testament kind of takes his bucket and he goes back to the Old Testament, he dips a little bit of water out of there, he walks back and he pours it into his pond, and that's his use of the, of the Old Testament. But I tell people all the time, that's really not the right way to think about the New Testament use of the old. 
It's not two ponds. It's more like a stream. It's a stream of flowing water that started at an original place many times in the Pentateuch, in the, uh, in the Torah, the five books of, uh, uh, that start out the Bible. It usually starts there, and then it flows. And it flows and it twists and it turns through many other places throughout the passages of Scripture, sometimes along the way even picking up some sediment, uh, some, some additional minerals that are, that are embedded in the water before it finally arrives at the New Testament when all of that refreshing uh, sort of stream and, and, and all the richness of the minerals that have been accumulated in it are then unpacked for us with glorious insight. And many times that stream, as we look into the Scripture, in fact, I would probably say most of the time, it involves a, a, a passage or a concept or a theological theme that begins in the writings of Moses, it begins in the Pentateuch, and then it is taken up later by the prophets. It's actually the prophets who were the first sort of exegetes or interpreters of the Old Testament. They were interpreting Moses. They were interpreting the Pentateuch. And sometimes we see it in other passages, the wisdom literature, the Psalms, and other places like that. But more often than not, it happens from Pentateuch to prophet, then finally to the New Testament. And there's no really better place for us to uh, sort of see that than by tracing this particular theme of Leviticus 18 and, and tonight uh, turning our attention to a passage which quotes it. There are a couple in the Old Testament actually, but tonight we're going to turn our attention to Ezekiel chapter 20. And I, I don't know, uh, in, in, in Dr. Chow's you know, words, he, he sort of outed us all in our unfamiliarity of Leviticus. Well, I'm one of those people that gave up uh, early on in my Christian reading whenever I came to Leviticus. And I, so I certainly n- never made it to Ezekiel. And uh, I don't know if you're any more familiar with this book, but it is in some cases a mystery for a lot of people. It has a lot of sort of strange visions and all kinds of spinning things that are going on throughout the book. But we're not going to dive into those early chapters and some of those strange visions. We're going to go to chapter 20 and to what is a very straightforward sort of expression of, of theology and of exegesis of the Old Testament. Ezekiel is taking what was essentially the message that he read in the Torah, in the Pentateuch, and he begins to apply it and to expound it and to uh, use it to illustrate what was going on in his own day. He begins in chapter 20 by telling us the occasion for this particular prophecy, this prophecy that's contained in chapter 20. Ezekiel had several prophecies, but he's telling us about this one. He was a prophet in exile in Babylon. This was, of course, after Israel had been conquered by Nebuchadnezzar and carried away into exile. That happened, you may remember, through a series of deportations. One of them took place in uh, 605, and then it was followed by one in 597, and then eventually 586, when they came in and completely decimated the entire city, broke down the temple, tore down the walls, moved every stone off of the others, and left it like an absolute sort of field. But Ezekiel is writing to us sometime between that first deportation and that final decimation of the city of Jerusalem. He's writing to us, he tells us in Ezekiel 20 verse 1, in the seventh year, which would be the seventh year of his exile, in the fifth month on the tenth day of the month. Now, Ezekiel was one of the ones who was deported in 597. So the seventh year, you do a little bit of math and you put together the month and the the day and the Jewish calendar with our uh, calendar, and you basically arrive at August of 591 when he's writing this. And he tells us that in this particular season, uh, before the, the final destruction of Jerusalem, he tells us that certain elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before him. Now, he doesn't tell us why they came to inquire of the Lord, but given the date, it's not hard to guess what was on their mind because back in the land of Israel, there had been a client king who was installed by Nebuchadnezzar, a man named Zedekiah, 
And Zedekiah had established diplomatic relations with Egypt. And he had begun to form an alliance with Egypt by which he was hoping to break away from his, his uh, uh, if you will, occupation or at least domination by, by Babylon. And so it makes sense that these guys had caught wind of the plot. And so they were coming to the prophet wanting to know, is it going to be successful? Is it going to be successful? Well, the Lord's answer here in verse 3 of Ezekiel 20 is pretty clear. Is it to inquire of me that you've come as I live, declares the Lord God, I will not be inquired by you. I'm not going to answer. I'm not going to play your games. I'm not going to pretend like somehow you're sincerely interested to know what my plan or my will is because you really haven't shown that interest in the past. I'm not going to cast my pearls before the swine, if you will. And beginning in verse 4, he launches into an explanation of why he's not going to answer them, why he He's not going to honor their request, why he doesn't take what they're saying as a serious inquiry, and why he's not going to entertain it as such. And his explanation basically takes up the, the, the bulk, of almost all the rest of the chapter, and is formulated in a series of subunits or cycles, different cycles that really represent different seasons of Israel's history, and all the cycles following the same basic pattern, recounting some blessing that God gave to Israel, and then secondly, recounting how Israel rebelled against the Lord in spite of it, and then thirdly, recounting God's response to their rebellion. So, so these cycles, these four cycles kind of uh, all happen in this threefold manner. Uh, each one of them, as it goes along, gets longer and longer as you go through the chapter, and you can almost feel from the, 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 the lengthening of each cycle, you can almost feel how the Lord's offense is growing each time that one of these cycles is recounting. He's, he's getting more and more, I don't know if the word would be impatient, that would be improper to say of the Lord, but certainly offended the longer it goes through Israel's history. But against all this backdrop of Israel's repeated rebellion and rejection of the Lord's kindness is His repeated determination to show them mercy in spite of their rebellion. And He's going to do it for one primary reason. And it's clear what that reason is. It's his own name and his own glory. I mean, it's just repeated again and again and again throughout the passage. In verse 8, for example, Then I said I would pour out my wrath on them and spend my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt, but I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations among whom they lived, in whose sight I made myself known to them, bringing them out of the land of Egypt. Go down to verse 13. Then I said I would pour out my wrath on them in the wilderness to make a full end of them. But I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations in whose sight I had brought them out. Down in verse 21. Then I said, I would pour out my wrath upon them and spend my anger against them in the wilderness, but I withheld my hand and acted for the sake of my name. All the way down near the end in verse 44, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I deal with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil deeds nor according to your corrupt deeds. That's the big picture here of what this whole chapter is about. It's really about Israel. If they're going to place their hope on anything, 
it is going to be on God's absolute commitment to be gracious for the sake of his own glory. Throughout all of their repeated failures, all the times they disappointed the Lord, all the times they may even even have disappointed themselves, again and again and again, when it seemed like they had pushed the Lord too far, the thing that secured them wasn't their own righteousness and their own goodness. It wasn't their own performance. It wasn't their own attractiveness. It wasn't any of those things. The thing that secured them was God's commitment to his own glory in redeeming them. And of course, the same is true for you and for me. Our greatest source of security, even when we are facing our weaknesses, when we're facing our stumblings and our failings, our greatest source of security is the unparalleled purpose of God's glory. He's redeeming people for his glory. This is Paul's message in Ephesians chapter 1. He says that over and over again, where God did whatever he did in electing and choosing and redeeming and, and adopting us for the praise of the glory of the riches of his grace, for the praise of the glory, for the praise of his glory. That's the big picture of what he wants them to understand. It has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with his kindness that's devoted to his own glory. Now, this message unfolds here in Ezekiel, as I mentioned to you, in a series of these cycles recounting Israel's history of rejecting the Lord despite his grace. It's really a history of God's grace. And, of course, for our particular interest tonight, he chooses to retell the history of Israel's rejection by repeatedly citing Leviticus 18.5. He, repeat, he repeats it a number of times throughout these, these cycles, as we will see, but it becomes very clear that all these hundreds of years after Moses wrote Leviticus, after all, those, all the time has passed, that this was, uh, first of all, a man who was steeped in the Word of God. He didn't stop when he got to Leviticus, but he read it, and he read it over and over and over again, and he got the message, the message of God's holiness and the message of the consequences when you violate that. So what I want to do is to walk through these cycles really quickly tonight so that you can begin to understand how a biblical writer took a previous passage and applied it and used it from, a, from an interpretive standpoint, a hermeneutical standpoint. And we can begin in verse 4 with the first of these cycles, which uh, I, I call uh, their rebellion despite the election of Israel. Rebellion despite the election of of Israel. This is what the Lord says. Will you judge them, son of man? Will you judge them? Let them know the abominations of their fathers and say to them, thus says the Lord God, on the day that I chose Israel, I swore to the offspring of the house of Jacob, making myself known to them in the land of Egypt. I swore to them saying, I am the Lord, your God. On that day, I swore to them that I would bring them up out of the land of Egypt into a land uh, that I had searched out for them, a land flowing with milk and honey and the most glorious of all lands. And I said to them, cast away the detestable things your, uh, your eyes feast on, every one of you. Do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. None of them cast away the detestable things their eyes feasted on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my wrath on them and spend my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for the sake of my name, that I should not be profaned in the sight of the nations among whom they lived, in whose sight I made myself known to them in bringing them out of the land of Egypt." Here we see this first cycle of God's blessing and then Israel's rejection and then God's response of mercy for his name's sake. He begins by calling for an evaluation, a judgment. 
for them, for, for Ezekiel and, and, and really for them to judge their own behavior in light of his blessing, beginning all the way back when God first called them as a nation out of Egypt. He recalls how he chose them. He elected them, Bahori. Dr. Marshall can correct my pronunciation afterward. It's my best stab at the Hebrew. He chose them. He elected them. That, that's the idea of God's loving and gracious selection of them. It becomes the foundation of all the other actions and responses of the Lord because he sovereignly chose Israel apart from every other Gentile nation. He selected the Israelite people apart from all the Gentiles, and he set a special love and a special purpose on them. This harkens back, of course, to Deuteronomy chapter 7, where it says, The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And it's not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you or chose you, for you are the fewest of all peoples, but it's because the Lord loves you. So he set his love on them as an act of his own initiative, his own electing sovereign choice. In fact, here in Ezekiel 20, the Lord repeats three times how he swore, literally, I raised my hand in the sense that he took an oath he took an oath and committed himself three times. First of all, that he elected them to be his special people and he would be their God. Secondly, he swore that he would reveal himself to them. And thirdly, he swore that he would bring them out of the land into a land he had selected for them. When God set his electing love on the Jewish people apart from all the Gentiles on the face of the earth, he was putting his name on the line. This was now an issue of his glory regarding whether or not this election of the Jewish people would falter, how he was going to deal with them uniquely and differently from the way he dealt with the Gentile nations. He was putting his name on the line when it came to that issue. That establishes the, the first part of this cycle, this element of God's blessing and then we see the second part, which was Israel's rejection. He says, then I told you to cast away, or I said to them to cast away the detestable things in verse 7 that your eyes feast on, every one of you. Don't defile yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord. But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. None of them cast away the detestable things their eyes feasted on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. So God immediately commands them to put away the idolatrous materials and idolatrous figurines that they had accumulated in Egypt. Now, a lot, of, a lot of people wonder about this because we don't really have any record of how Israel lived while they were down in Egypt. Any, we don't have any kind of record of their religious sort of practices. So some people think that Ezekiel here is tapping into maybe some sort of oral tradition that told about them being idolatrous while they were back in Egypt. This then would be the only passage anywhere in the Bible that told us that Israel was actually idolatrous while they were in Egypt. But I don't actually think it, he needs to learn that from some oral tradition because you could surmise that or you could come to that conclusion pretty easily by just seeing how rapidly they fell into idolatry the moment the Lord brought them out of Egypt at the foot of Mount Sinai, when they defiled themselves with the idols of Egypt. I mean, that's not a, that's not a hard conclusion. I remember when I was a missionary in China, and uh, I, used to, I used to get care packages in these little boxes that came from friends, and uh, sometimes they would be open, and sometimes people would have stolen the things by the time I got home. And I remember one time I came home, and uh, my, I, my box was open, and I was just upset and I knew that it was my Russian roommate, another teacher who was there teaching from Russia. And I went to him and I said, Sasha, did you open up my care package? And he just kind of sort of backed up. He's like, look, I didn't, I didn't touch your chocolates. <laughs> See, sometimes it's not uh, reach to make a conclusion, right? When someone seems too familiar with something. Well, Israel just seemed too familiar with idolatry. So, 
So it, it's not a stretch to imagine that that's what was taking place. They had, they had become idolatrous while they were in Egypt. And so whenever they were at the foot of Mount Sinai, they poured all of their gold into some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, vat and fashioned it into a, a golden calf, as we know, and they declared, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. It was at this point in Exodus 32, verse 9, that the Lord determined that He was going to destroy them. The Lord said to Moses, Exodus 32, 9, I've seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my, my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order to make a great nation of you. And Moses made an appeal to the Lord in verse 11. O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them? Verse 14, and the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on this people. This is exactly what Ezekiel is re recounting here. He says it right here in verse 8. Then I said I would pour out my wrath on them. I would spend my anger against them. In verse 9, but I acted for the sake of my name. And Moses made this appeal, and he made it on the basis of God's name. God, if you did this, the people in Egypt, what are they going to say? They're going to say that you didn't fulfill your promises to this Jewish people, that you didn't keep your oath that you swore to them. That kind of completes the threefold cycle, God's blessing and electing Israel, Israel's rebellion against God, and then God in His mercy not utterly destroying them. But in terms of the Old Testament use of the old, we already see here Ezekiel using previous portions of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, in what we can say is just a very straightforward manner. We might even say he's using it illustratively, he's using it to illustrate a point, but I think it would be better to say he's using it theologically to show the hardness of Israel's heart and depravity from the very beginning. In fact, this is exactly the way Moses intended it to be used because when Moses wrote the book of Exodus, he didn't write it simply or merely as a history you might read it that way, and that might be all of your fascination is putting together the historical details, but what Moses wanted you to get when you read Genesis or Exodus or even Leviticus, Numbers or Deuteronomy, what he wanted you to get was not history. What he wanted you to get was theology. He was trying to teach you theology. He wrote it to teach you certain truths, not only about man, uh, about humanity, but he was writing it to teach you certain truths about Israel and about God and about redemption. And so right away we see Ezekiel using the Old Testament and using it exactly the way it was intended to be used, the way that Moses, its original author, intended it to be used. Well, that brings us to the second cycle in this prophecy, which takes us into the wilderness era. And we see the sort of same thing repeated over again. Verse 10, so I led them out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. I gave them my statutes and made known to them my rules by which if a person does them, he shall live. There's our quote from Leviticus 18. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them, that they may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes, but rejected my rules, by which if a person does them, he shall live. And my Sabbaths they greatly profaned. Then I said, I will pour out my wrath on them in the wilderness and make a full end of them. But I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations in whose sight I had brought them out. Moreover, I swore to them in the wilderness, I will not bring you into the land that I had given to them, a land flowing with milk and honey, the most glorious of all lands. 
because they rejected my rules and did not walk in my statutes and profaned my Sabbaths, for their hearts went after their idols. Here again, this threefold cycle, God blessing, uh, blessing in the beginning, Israel rejecting, and God showing them mercy. The blessing in this particular case was the revelation of His law. He says in verse 11, I gave them my statutes and my rules. Here's our key verse. And it immediately raises the question that is asked so many times when it comes to these interconnected links in the Scripture. It raises the question of how is Ezekiel using this? Is he using it faithfully? Is he using it according to its original intent, the intent of Moses? Well, I guess to some extent it depends on who you ask. And to some extent it depends on what they think the original intent of Moses was because probably at this point the majority of commentators focus in on the concept of life the comment, he shall live by them, and they immediately draw a conclusion that what Moses was talking about was a quality of life. If you do the commandments, it will yield you a kind of quality of life. And a lot of them will even cross-reference other passages that talk about the law and the blessings that come from the law. For example, Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you will meditate on it day and night so that you'll be careful to do all that's written in it, for then it will, I will make your way prosperous and you'll have good success. So if you do the commandments, you'll have a quality of life, a kind of prosperity of life. Or they'll cite Deuteronomy 4, Therefore, you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you. So again, the idea is prosperity. And they would say that Ezekiel was tapping into this basic idea, using the passage to talk about walking in the blessings of the law, but Israel was just missing the blessings. But, of course, the problem with all of that is that Joshua 1.8 or Deuteronomy 4, while they talk about the law, they're missing a key word, live, which Dr. Chow helped us to understand doesn't talk about quality of life. It talks about survival. That's its basic meaning. In fact, I read... Uh, one writer uh, this week that said, I think it was in all 729 uses of the Hebrew word hayah, it always has that in that sense. Live versus dying. Survival in its broadest sense. I don't know if I would say all of them, but certainly, certainly in the Pentateuch, that seems to be far and away the predominant meaning. You may have some meanings in the wisdom literature later that talk about quality, but in the Pentateuch, this is all about survival. I I think it's easily demonstrated in just one passage in Exodus chapter 1, verse 16, when the king of Egypt said to the midwives, when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it's a son, you shall kill him, but if it's a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. That's the way you normally find the word used. It's a contrast. You either live or you die. You either live or you die. It's not to say that there aren't blessings for keeping the law, and there are passages that talk about that. But this passage, as Dr. Chow showed us, Leviticus 18 is an imperative that you must keep the law if you have any hope of surviving. And this is the point that Ezekiel's bringing out. This is what he finds in Leviticus. The Lord blesses Israel with the revelation of His statutes, uh, as uh, Dr. Chow uh, talked to us about, the rules, the sort of boundaries, and His judgments, his mishpat, which are these legal decisions, which in many cases are legal decisions involving the death penalty. 
So even in the terminology that he uses for the law, there's this focus on contrast between life and death, life and death. Obeying God's law allows you to survive. Disobeying it, you face the penalty of death. And Moses actually put this before Israel in Deuteronomy 30. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life so that you and your offspring may live. This is, this is what Ezekiel understood from Leviticus. And this is what he's keying into, this particular use of the Old Testament. And, and once again, He's using it exactly the way Moses intended it to be understood, exactly the way that Moses uh, intended it to be used. He's using it to demonstrate that Israel has ignored that warning. They've rebelled against the Lord, they've rebelled against His law, and therefore the Lord is totally justified in His wrath and His intention to destroy them, but His choice not to destroy them is a testimony to His mercy, a radical commitment to His name. By the way, He even highlights in here one particular violation above all others, which was the Sabbath. Verse 12, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. He highlights this Sabbath law, the Sabbath, particularly because it was the sign of the Mosaic covenant, the sign of the law, if you will. All of God's covenant have signs. The rainbow was a sign for the Noahic covenant. Circumcision was a sign for the Abrahamic covenant. But the Sabbath was the sign for the Mosaic covenant. And here he says that it was a sign so that you might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. In other words, it was a sign that God has sanctified, or we might say it this way, it was a sign that God had set apart Israel from all the Gentile people. In the Exodus, when God first gives the Ten Commandments, He, he refers to the Sabbath and broadly sort of states it in the context of His own resting on the seventh day. But when it comes to Deuteronomy, when it comes to Deuteronomy 5 and the restatement of the law, he squarely puts the focus on his redemption of Israel out of Egypt. He says, you shall remember, and when he gives the, the, the Sabbath command, you shall remember you were slaves in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. So they were to provide a day of rest, not even primarily for themselves. They were provide a day of rest for everyone in their household. As a matter of fact, they were even to give rest to their animals. All of this to commemorate how God had freed them, had given them rest, if you will, from slavery. So a key part of this commemoration was a symbol of how the Lord had elected them and set them apart from the Gentile nations. Exodus 31, 12, the Lord said to Moses, you're to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between you and me through all your generations that you might know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. I set you apart. But of course, here in Ezekiel, Ezekiel says, you haven't done that. You rebelled against me. You didn't walk in my statutes. You rejected my rules in verse 13. And you profaned my Sabbath. So the second element of the cycle emerges, which takes us to the third. Then I said I would pour out my wrath on them in the wilderness to make a full end of them, but I acted for the sake of my name, that it might not be profaned in the sight of the nations, the goyim, the, the Gentiles, in whose sight I had brought them out. Moreover, I swore to them in the wilderness I wouldn't bring them into the land they had given them, the land flowing with milk and honey, the most glorious of all lands, because they had rejected my rules, didn't walk in my statutes, and profaned my Sabbaths. And they went after other idols. So here 
Again, the Lord responds with forbearance and mercy primarily because of his own glory, but this time there's a consequence because that first generation, they wouldn't enter the promised land. They would wander in the desert for 40 years until that generation had died off. That brings us to the third of these four cycles. In verse 17, this is rebellion despite his preservation. So we have rebellion in spite of his election, and then you have rebellion in spite of his revelation, and now you have rebellion in spite of his preservation of them. He says in verse 17, find it down here, Nevertheless, my eye spared them. I did not destroy them or make a full end of them in the wilderness. And I said to their children in the wilderness, Do not walk in the statutes of your fathers, nor keep their rules, nor defile yourself with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules and keep my Sabbaths holy, that, you may, that it may be a sign between me and you, and that you might know that I am the Lord your God. But the children rebelled against me. They did not walk in my statutes and were not careful to obey my rules, by which, if a person does them, he shall live. They profaned my Sabbaths. Then I said, I will pour out my wrath on them and spend my anger against them in the wilderness. But I withheld my hand and acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations in whose sight I had brought them out. Moreover, I swore to them in the wilderness that I would scatter them among the nations and disperse them through the countries because they had not obeyed my rules but had rejected my statutes and profaned my Sabbaths, and their eyes were set on their father's idols. Moreover, I gave them statutes that were not good and rules by which they could not have life. And I defiled them through their very gifts and the offering of their, all their firstborn that I might devastate them. I did it that they might know that I am the Lord. We can actually move a little quicker here because the whole cycle is becoming familiar to us. He blesses them by not making a full end of them. That is to say, he preserves them there in verse 17. He even provided food for them, uh, manna through all those years. He provided that for 40 years of wandering, their clothes didn't wear out and their sandals didn't fall off their feet. My wife's always throwing my shoes out after five years. You know, I, don't even, I couldn't get 40 out of them. But he, he gave them 40 years in those same shoes. And he reminds them of the warnings that he had given to previous generations. But the cycle moves to the second phase nonetheless. In verse 21, they rebelled against me and they did not walk in my statutes. They weren't careful to obey my rules by which if a person does them, he shall live. Once again... He reminds them of the uh, principle of the law of Leviticus 18.5 that by right of judgment, they should have died. By right of judgment, they should not have survived. But we see the third part of the cycle. I said I would pour out my wrath in verse 21. I would spend my anger, but I withheld my hand. I acted for the sake of my name that it would not be profaned in the sight of the nations in whose sight I brought them out. Once again, the Lord is committed to His glory. We're thankful for that. And in the days that we don't have the power to carry on, when we feel like we, in our own strength, would, would throw in the towel, give up on this Christian walk, we're reminded that the Lord's name is so precious to him. He will not allow that. He will not allow any of us to be lost. He won't allow it because his own glory and his own name is on the line. And he's telling Israel, I'm not going to allow it with you. But the consequences of their ongoing rebellion were getting worse. The discipline of the Lord was being inflicted on the nation because at this point in verse 23, he'll scatter them among the nations and disperse them through the countries. By the way, this is while they're still in the wilderness. He wouldn't scatter them for literally centuries, almost 700 years later, 
But Moses had already warned about it even while they were still in the wilderness. He told them in Deuteronomy 28, the Lord will scatter you among all the peoples from one end of the earth to the other. There you will serve other gods of wood, which neither you nor your fathers have known. And among the nations you'll find no respite. There shall be no resting place for the sole of your feet. But the Lord will give you there a trembling heart and failing eyes and a languished soul. Even right here in Ezekiel chapter 25 says, Moreover, I gave them statutes that were not good and rules by which they could not have life. Now, this is not a quotation of Leviticus, but it's certainly an allusion. Sometimes when we talk about the Bible's use of other passages of the Bible, we mean different things. Sometimes we're talking about just the broad storylines like Dr. Chow was introducing for us earlier today. The Bible just uses the broad storylines. Sometimes the Bible uses previous sections as direct quotations, and sometimes they are allusions. They just use similar words uh, connecting key phrases or something like that. So that's what you have going on here. But this time, he says, these are statutes that were not good and rules that could not bring life or by which you could not have life. Now, there's a lot of debate about what this means. Uh, It's the same words, the statutes and the rules that he's been talking about that he gave them back in Sinai. And he even, as I said, sort of uses the terminology from Leviticus But without going into sort of all the points and counterpoints of what everyone thinks is going on here, let me just suggest to you that this is a reference to the negative consequences of the law that come after their ongoing rebellion. Very similar to what Paul says of the law in Romans chapter 7 in verse 12. He says, so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good And then he asked in verse 13, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what was good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. So Paul says, look, the law is good. It's not not good. It's good and it's holy and it's righteous, but when one disobeys the law, it brings devastating consequences. Paul says it actually produces death. It it defines the violations of your life. It defines the penalties of those violations. And once all of that is defined, your, your guilt increases immensely because your number of violations increase. You know, we have uh, in my neighborhood, like most neighborhoods, we have sort of these neighborhood streets that are paved uh, by asphalt, obviously. And I have had vehicles, various vehicles in the, in the past that uh, me or my son were tinkering on that were not street legal. And uh, we will take those cars or trucks and we will drive them around our neighborhood sometimes. But I would never take them outside my neighborhood onto the main roads. Why? Because if I do that, the penalties and the laws associated with that increase exponentially. So even though I'm driving the same vehicle on similar asphalt, whenever I cross into that zone, my violations increase and I could face some stiff penalties. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying when the law came in, It just defined all these violations that I didn't even know that I had, and now they're stacking up against me, and the consequences are overwhelming me. And sin has now become much more sinful because of the law. Well, this is what God's saying His law did eventually for Israel. The result of Him giving the law in that sense was not good. It actually made them, in verse 26, more defiled, and he says it devastated them. Quickly, that brings us to the fourth cycle, which is rebellion despite provision of the land. 
I thought about saying rebellion despite occupation, but I thought in the current political environment, occupation wasn't the best word for Israel. So we'll, see, we'll, we'll stick with provision. Rebellion despite provision of the land. He says in verse 27, Therefore, son of man, speak to the house of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord, In this also your fathers blasphemed me by dealing treacherously with me. For when I brought them into the land that I swore to give them, then wherever they saw any high hill or any leafy tree, there they offered their sacrifices, and there they presented the provocation of their offerings. There they set up their pleasing aromas, and there they poured out their drink offerings, all that referring to their idolatry. I said to them, what is the high place to which you go? So its name is called Bama to this day. Therefore, Say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, will you defile yourselves after the manner of your fathers and go whoring after their detestable things? When you present your gifts and offer up your children in the file, you defile yourselves with all your idols to this day. Shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel? As I live, declares the Lord, I will not be inquired by you. Now, now, we, now we get the big picture. Now we know why he's not going to answer these elders why he's not going to entertain their inquiry. They've proven themselves to be insincere. He goes on in verse 32, What's in your mind shall never happen. The thought, let us be like the nations, like the tribes of the countries who worship wood and stone. As I live, declares the Lord, surely with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where I scattered you with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, with wrath poured out. I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. As I enter into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness and the land of Egypt, so I'll enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord. I will make you pass under the rod. I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge out the rebels from among you. Those who transgress, I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, and, I, and they, they shall enter into the land of Egypt. Then they will know, or you will know, that I am the Lord. Again, this is... This is kind of familiar territory. God blesses them this time by giving them the promised land, and yet what do they do? They rebel. They set up idols. They go on all these high hills and under these leafy trees. They actually, in verse 32, become envious of the Gentile nations and determine that they're going to be just like them. But then you see God's response, and this time it has massive consequences. First of all, his immediate response, he's not going to, He's not going to respond to their inquiries. But in verse 33, he declares that he's actually going to bring them back from their current captivity. And he's going to rescatter them. He says in verse 35, I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples. And here is yet another use of the Old Testament, this time not in terms of of uh, history or illustration, not in terms of quotation or allusion, but this is what we might call typology, which is basically a fancy word for patterns. He's just saying, I'm going to repeat the pattern. Just like I sent your forefathers into a wilderness, I'm going to send you into a long season of wandering outside the promised land. But this is going to be a season of wandering that takes you into all the nations. It's not going to be defined to the Arabian Peninsula. You're going to wander all over the world. And it's going to go on and on and on and on until, verse 38, until he has purged out the rebels from among you. He's going to do all this before he finally brings them back into the land. And he's going to do it for the same reason. And in verse 44, for his holy name. For his holy name. And of course, from our vantage point, we can see that all of this has been historically true for Israel, even up to today. Even today, they're still wondering. Even though they've reestablished a nation in the land of Canaan, 
they're still rebellious against the Lord. And the majority of Jews, as a matter of fact, don't even reside in the land of Israel. They're still scattered all over the world. But that's not the end. Because after these four cycles fulfill their purpose, we see finally in verses 40 through 44, restoration. Restoration despite the rejection of Israel. He says in verse 40, For on my holy mountain, the mountain height of Israel, declares the Lord, there all the house of Israel, all of them, shall serve me in the land. There I will accept them, and there I will require your contributions and the choices of your gifts with all your sacred offerings. As a pleasing aroma, I will accept you when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out from the countries where you've been scattered, and I will manifest my holiness among them in the sight of the nations. And you'll know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, the country that I swore to give to your fathers. And there you will remember your ways and all your deeds which you have, uh, th- by, with which you have defiled yourselves, and you will loathe yourselves for all the evils you've committed. In other words, they'll be repentant. And you'll know that I am the Lord when I deal with you for my own namesake, not according to your evil deeds, not according to your corrupt deeds. This is beautiful restoration. It's really the entire course of world history, all mapped along a single axis. The axis of God's depra- I mean, uh, Israel's depravity and God's mercy. He's been working out this plan. He's been working out all along and is all sort of bound up. It was all sort of foretold right there in the Pentateuch. And the pieces were put together from the very beginning. The pieces not only of, uh, of what God was calling them to be, but the pieces of how they were going to fail and what they deserved. And one of the central pieces in Leviticus was that you, if you don't obey these statutes and these, these judgments, you'll die. You won't survive unless it be by God's mercy unless it be by God's mercy. What's the message in all this? Well, certainly it's the message that you and I stand in the same position as any Israelite in the sense of us having failed God's righteous standards. We don't deserve to survive any more than they did. You don't deserve to survive. This very day, because of your deeds, you would stand under the judgment of God. But because of his mercy and because of his commitment to his glory, he calls, he redeems and adopts, and he eventually glorifies those that he's chosen. If you're here today, I don't know where you are in your spiritual walk with the Lord, and I don't know what kind of cycles you're going through. I don't know how many times you have stumbled and fallen and disappointed the Lord and disappointed yourself. I don't know your story, but it can't be any worse than Israel's story. And I do know that if you have fallen and if you failed, and you reach out and you cling to nothing else but God's love for the praise of His glory, and you ask for God's mercy, it's there in abundance. It's there in abundance. That's the story of Scripture. It's the story of Israel. It's the story of redemption. And it's the story that the biblical writers were piecing together. We'll have a chance to see more of that in the morning. Uh, In the Sunday school hour, going into the New Testament, and even in the worship hour, we're going to come back and we're going to see that that story was the story that the biblical writers, the New Testament writers, tapped into when they preached the gospel. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for this glorious message. It is something that we need to be familiar with. As the great men of old 
so versed in your holy word, it flowed through their veins. But with that, they saw all the glory of your working through the gospel. I pray that you would help us this weekend to see it as well, so that we, when we read, when we pray, and when we sing, that we might sing with the richness of all that you've revealed about yourself. We ask in Christ's name, amen.